This is uh, Unit 2 and Chapter 2 um, in Business Ethics, uh, Newbury College, Fall 2021. Uh, I'm Professor Marsh. Um, this is uh, called Ethical Decision Making, Personal and Professional Contexts, is the chapter in your book. Um, remember that uh, the first three units uh, in the course are just chapters one through three. Uh, beginning in chapter four, uh, we begin to split some of the longer chapters into two units. Uh, there's a cold opening. Uh, am I about to lose my job? What would you do? I'm going to save a decision of that uh, to the end of the presentation. Uh, I do love the quote at the beginning of the chapter from former Indian uh, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. Uh, there are two kinds of people. Uh, those who do the work and those who take the credit. Try to be in the first group. There's less competition there. Uh, that's a, uh, uh, that's a, an excellent uh, and very true quote. Uh, we're going to be talking about not just decision-making, but accountable decision-making. Uh, and uh, that's necessary to put ethics into practice. The chapter objectives are going to be to be able to learn how to describe a process for ethically responsible decision making, apply this model to ethical decision points, uh, that's going to be a very important model for you, explain the reasons why good people might engage in unethical behavior, and explore the impact of managerial roles on the nature of our decision making. So let's jump into the chapter and see how we can learn to understand those objectives. The ethical decision-making process. Uh, ethical decision-making requires a persuasive and rational justification for a decision. It can't be arbitrary. It has to be persuasive uh, so that the organization will accept it and so that it's fair and uh, justifiable to the stakeholders. It is a logical process of decision making and it considers the facts, alternate perspectives, consequences to all stakeholders, and ethical principles. Note the importance of perceptual differences in thinking about alternate, alternative perspectives. Can you imagine yourself in the other stakeholders' seats? Uh, here's a hint, improvise and go around the table. Uh, more about that later. Uh, take a look at figure 2.2 in your book. And that is a very uh, important uh, figure. Uh, it, uh, it shows, let's see if I can find it. It's, it's the ethical decision-making process, and it, it goes step by step. Uh, first, determine the facts. Identify the ethical issues involved. Identify the stakeholders and consider the situation from each of their points of view, uh, what I call going around the table. Uh, every stakeholder gets a seat at the table, and every one of them, uh, as you're considering the decision, you should try to put yourself in their seat and consider the situation from their point of view. Consider the available alternatives, uh, what the book sometimes calls your moral imagination, and then compare and weigh the alternatives based on the consequences for all the stakeholders, duties, rights, and privileges, and principles, sorry, not privileges, duties, rights, and principles, and the implications for personal integrity and character. And after doing that comparison, then you make a decision, and then you monitor uh, and learn from the outcome. So uh, in my outline of the chapter, I've added the words each of in the third step, uh, after from and before there, so that it uh, reads, identify stakeholders and consider the situation from each of their points of view. Uh, steps three and four 
require you uh, to do some imitation and some improvisational work, uh, almost like acting class. You have to put yourself as honestly as possible inside each of the seats at the stakeholder table and imagine discussing the issue from the perspective of each of them. Uh, you might even get into some dialogue, uh, some imaginary dialogue. Imagine what the responses would be of each of the stakeholders to the other stakeholders' uh, positions. And uh, the book from pages 34 to 44 presents this material very well. You will find that this is one of the most important points in the entire book. So read this part carefully and learn it th thoroughly. Uh, we will come back to the ethical decision-making model over and over again during the semester. Uh, so this is really important. Then look at figure 2.1 again, which I, I skipped over for a minute. Pretend that the rectangle in the center of the diagram is a conference table and that a representative of each of the stakeholders is sitting in the six seats around the table. So this is, this is the uh, one I'm talking about, this, this figure right here, 2.1. And that's, uh, that's the employees, the customers, the local community, the government, the suppliers, and the owners. Now your stakeholders might not always be all of them, uh, but that's a good uh, uh, place to start. Think about the decision to be made from the perspective of each of these, one by one. In your head, or if you need to write it out, do so. Imagine what each of them would say about the consequences, duties, rights, principles, and implications of the possible decisions. What decision would they present? What would, what would they advance, and how might the others respond to it? And, and do note the term moral imagination, which is the ability to envision uh, various alternative choices, consequences, resolutions, benefits, and harms. It's sort of like brainstorming, uh, but with guardrails. I again encourage you to commit figures 2.1 and 2.2 to memory. These are the tools we will use throughout the semester. Now, on page 44, uh, we apply the decision-making model uh, to um, a very simple case that's used to illustrate it. Should McDonald's or Burger King voluntarily decide to pay its workers a minimum wage of $15 per hour? What facts are relevant? That might be the first place to start uh, under your ethical decision-making model. Is fairness the only ethical issue? What does fairness mean? What does fairness mean in this context? Who are the stakeholders? Employees, customers, shareholders, others? Uh, what are the alternatives? Uh, be creative and consider what some of the alternatives might be. Uh, it seems like a yes or no decision, but uh, perhaps uh, there are other alternatives. And complete the process yourself. Make a decision and predict and imagine the consequences. Uh, this would be your first attempt to satisfy the Unit 2, Objective Number 2, applying the model to an ethical decision point. But I encourage you to read this material very carefully and to see how the book presents it. Uh, you're going to see it again and again. Let's go on to the question of why, when good people do bad acts. And... Uh, the book reminds us not to underestimate the real possibility of immoral choices and unethical behavior. Uh, that's in your textbook at page 45. Uh, but the book also presents uh, some ways in which good people go bad. People who don't have uh, immoral choices don't believe that they're engaging in unethic unethical behavior, uh, but fall into uh, some bad acts and ones that in retrospect appear to be bad ethical choices. Uh, so, uh, you know, people who are well-intentioned can have willful ignorance. Uh, they can have blinders on, uh, only considering limited alternatives. They can oversimplify uh, the decision rules. 
uh, they can satisfy, uh, as your book says, uh, using uh, minimum decision criteria. So as soon as they come to an easy, uh, you know, or, or a logical, what they seems to be a logical decision, uh, without uh, sufficiently identifying all the criteria, uh, they satisfy. There can be weakness of will, just making an easy choice. Let's do what's easy today. Uh, without considering without considering what the long-term consequences will be. And then what I call the cowardly lion syndrome, uh, a lack of courage, especially in the face of peer pressure. Uh, ethical decisions make ethical decision making in managerial roles. Uh, so we have the first discussion of leading by example. Uh, uh, you've got bad examples and good examples. Uh, what I think of as uh, maybe Hollywood decisions versus some of the decisions that famous generals have had to make. Uh, then we also have a discussion of personal and professional decision making, two different types of decision making. Uh, personal decision making are questions that involve personal integrity and making a decision from the perspective of your own values. Professional decision making is making a decision from the perspective of your role within an organization. You have to consider both perspectives and try to balance them. A well-designed organization creates constraints that require individuals to be faithful to the organization's values and responsibilities. So sometimes you may be making a professional decision for your organization, which is not the same decision that you would make personally. And that can cause a conflict, and we're going to see examples of that uh, throughout, uh, throughout the uh, semester. So with respect to leading by example, if the boss is seen acting badly, the employees just got a coupon to do so. Uh, <laughs> and they will. Uh, that's just my comment. I once saw an interview with the actor Susan Sarandon and uh, you know Oscar winner and, and famous uh, for many many movies uh, I think my favorite movie of hers is Bull Durham the the baseball movie with Kevin Costner and Tim Robbins uh, and the interviewer asked her about whether she got jealous or felt bad uh, when she saw her husband uh, who she met doing Bull Durham the equally famous Oscar winning actor Tim Robbins uh, when he was doing a love scene with some other actress and she said no, she didn't feel bad, but she felt as though she got a coupon to act out with some other actor other than her husband in the future. Uh, there was an audience, you know, it was a talk show, and they laughed and applauded. But that's not the way to act. That's not the ethical way to act. Maybe they act that way in Hollywood, but that's no way to organize a society if you want relationships to succeed. And, of course, Sarandon and Robbins are no longer together. Uh, contrast that with being at a job where you see a manager who says no to the supplier who wants a kickback, even though it would have been good money, uh, or take, t takes a pay cut to avoid a layoff of rank-and-file employees. That's somebody you want to follow. That's a leader. George Washington was famous for personally leading his soldiers into battle with the British, riding on his big white horse amidst all the flying bullets this huge man on a huge horse. This was somebody that the soldiers wanted to follow. If you ever saw the movie Patton, uh, you probably remember Patton jumping into the road uh, when they were in Africa to fire at the German airplanes and the trail of the plane's bullets hitting all over the road on both sides of him uh, and somehow missing where he was standing. Uh, if you saw that movie or any good film about soldiers in wartime, you prob you've probably thought about whether you could stand up to that enemy fire or whether you'd run and hide. Uh, there's a famous scene of Patton giving a speech standing in front of a big American flag, and it addresses this exact point. Soldiers in battle in a well-trained army are constantly reminded that they are to look out for their buddies, for the other soldiers fighting alongside of them, what gives us courage when the enemy is firing at us is the responsibility to watch out for our comrades in arms. When we can think 
of the safety and success of others instead of ourselves. That's true in the mil military, and it's also true in well-run businesses. You have a culture of looking out for your fellow workers, uh, and you have managers who are looking out for you. A well-designed organization creates workers and managers who are required to work out for who are required to look out for the welfare of others and the company as a whole. It becomes part of their culture. Okay, resolving the opening decision point. This is page 51. How can you keep an important secret and not lie in answering a direct question? I mean, this is the this is the decision point that asks you how are you going to respond in a situation in which you have to be loyal to your responsibility to the organization not to spill the beans about what's a confidential project that you're working on, but also not lie to your fellow workers. Uh, here are some possible alternatives uh, that I've thought of. I'm not sure that the book, how the book feels about this, but these are certainly situations that I get into uh, uh, in uh, uh, my job as an attorney. A lot of times I can't spill the beans either. So uh, possible alternatives. Uh, you might say, I can't say for sure what will happen if there's an element of doubt. Uh, that would be honest, uh, but still wouldn't give up uh, the secret. Or you could say, I am required to keep my word completely confidential. I am not allowed to answer such a question. Well, you just did, doofus, okay? If you, if you get your back up uh, and are inartful about your answer, uh, I think uh, your coworker is going to uh, see between the lines. Uh, one, of, one that was suggested to me by a, uh, uh, an English uh, client is you could say, well, it's all bollocked up. Uh, now, that's uh, kind of a, a polite, more polite euphemism for a, a swear word. Uh, don't try it with your English coworkers. They know what it means, and, and it's it's not it's it's a little crude. Uh, but uh, in, in any event, that might uh, allow you just to deflect and distract. Uh, and it sounds kind of funny too. So maybe you know maybe they'll laugh about it. Uh, you could say, "Don't worry about it. This isn't about you." That's probably the least honest response. Uh, that'll get you off the hook uh, for a little while, but then uh, you know you. You will have violated perhaps your personal ethics, uh, or maybe say nothing and shrug. You know, you might get away with that with some people, but it might invite additional uh, uh, inquiry uh, from somebody who's really concerned. There's no perfect answer to this question. If you were assigned to evaluate the financial viability of a business as part of a restructuring, right-sizing, merger, or reorganization, you need to keep your work conclusions and recommendations confidential until they're presented to management. However, in order to do the best job, you need to gain the trust and confidence of the employees that you are evaluating in order to get accurate information and honest responses to your questions. It's a very difficult act to balance, and you will often have conflicts like the one presented in the chapter decision point. Feel free to go through the ethical decision-making model and see for yourself what result you come to. It might be something I haven't even thought of. On the slide, I present some alternative solutions. Some are better than others. Uh, as a lawyer, I'm constantly asked questions I can't answer because of the attorney-client confidentiality requirement. If you remember the movie The Firm with Tom Cruise, the Tom Cruise character was able to persuade the Moralto brothers not to whack him because as their lawyer, he was prohibited from telling the FBI the secrets about their organized crime network. Uh, I found that plot resolution uh, device ethically satisfying, uh, probably more ethically satisfying uh, than the book's solution, uh, as written by John Grisham, but also very highly improbable. Uh, my wife was a healthcare consultant for Ernst & Young for over 25 years. She frequently had an assignment similar to the one presented in the decision point of Chapter 2, and she often had to choose between deception, deflection, misdirection, or feigning ignorance when the workers in the practice or facility asked her what she was going to recommend to the board. If you look at the possible answers presented on slide number 8, I do prefer the first choice. It's truthful. Often the person with this sort of assignment 
has only the authority to make recommendations. Often a senior manager or board of the client will make the actual decision about where to cut, who to fire. The second choice is the rookie mistake. If you get your backup, you're going to lose the trust you need to get the job done. And you'll essentially answer the question, the worker will assume the worst, and start resume shopping and packing up to go home. I like the third choice, which the client from the UK told me about some years ago. Apparently the word in question is a crude uh, bit of slang, and uh, it does sound kind of funny. If you get pre pressed to follow up, you can go with the misdirection that the slang is a nicer way to avoid saying something really dirty, and that might get a laugh. Uh, and then you can change the subject. The fourth choice is an outright lie. If you start down this road, where does it end? The fifth choice is also a possibility, although the worried worker is more likely to press you for an actual answer. So, in review for Unit 2 and Chapter 2, please commit the ethical decision-making process to memory. That's Figure 2.2. .2. That's that multi-step process of making an ethical decision. Please also picture all of the stakeholders involved in an ethical decision, uh, that they have a seat around the table in Figure 2.1, and use your moral imagination to predict the dialogue in the negotiations over a decision. Be familiar with the concepts of change blindness, inattentional blindness, and normative myopia. Uh, you're becoming <coughs> a, uh, uh, perhaps an ophthalmologist of business ethics, uh, curing those diseases. And don't forget that the manager has to consider both personal and professional decision making over ethical issues, and sometimes that can be in conflict. Now we're going to go on to Unit 3, where we'll, we'll study philosophical ethics and business. Uh, thanks again. Have a great day, and we'll see you in Unit 3.